hi everyone, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, you've officially made it to the last session of the day, so congratulations. Thank you for uh, your interest and being diligent uh, and coming, coming listen, listening to our talk. Um, so, uh, as Lars said, I'm George Saab. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of being the person who runs the Java group at Oracle. Um, I'm also the chairperson of the OpenJDK governing board. And uh, I'll have to show you this, which says, if you're going to make decisions about buying things, we're going to be talking about stuff that's happening in the future. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know, things change. That's what this slide is about. OK, so um, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to talk just a little bit about Java in general and kind of what's going on. And then Michael is going to talk a whole bunch about some of the projects that we're currently working on. Um, I, I think, uh, I, I suspect uh, in this room there are a lot of people who use Java a lot, and so I may not you know, need to uh, twist your arm or, or convince you uh, of why Java SE is important. Um, obviously, we think it's a great technology. Um, you know, my group is one that uh, came from Sun Microsystems and has been working on Java for many, many, many years. Um, and so it's something that we're passionate about and we love speaking with people who use the technology and you know, we love hearing success stories. Uh, we're also interested in hearing about challenges that you have. So uh, we're always happy to be at conferences like this and, and I hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, I, I think you know, when we think about Java uh, and how it has evolved, one of the things that we always try to be conscious of is having an, an evolution which is uh, very thoughtful and not haphazard. Uh, Java has never been a technology that's been sort of chasing the latest features and just kind of tacking things on the side. Um, we really try to make sure when we add something that we understand what it's good for, why you might want it. Um, we go through a lot of work to basically do our development of new features now in the open, in OpenJDK. Um, and so this is something you can take advantage of. You can actually go to OpenJDK, you can sign up to mailing lists. Uh, you can see the design discussions that we're having as we work on new features. Um, and what you'll find if you do that is um, things that you think are really simple, like, you know, they're adding closures to Java. How long could that take? Um, it's obvious. Um, well, you know, in fact, when you look at something like Lambdas in Java 8, and it looks obvious, that's because a lot of time and a lot of hard work has gone into making it obvious. I guarantee you that if we took the first design that we had for Lambdas and had run with that, we would have had something out very, very quickly. Um, but it would not have felt as natural. And it would have had a lot of challenges, a lot of problems, a lot of frustrations. Um, and in fact, those are the kind of things that tend to actually accumulate um, when you're making a technology and you're not just thinking of, you know, well, how do I get it out in six months? You're thinking of, you know, how is this going to persist? You know, how is this going to be viewed in five years or ten years? How are the things that I do in this feature going to enable us to do new things going forward or prevent us from doing some of the things we want to do? Um, you know, th those are the, the sort of deep things that we think about. Um, I will say that you know, when, when I mentioned the mailing list, we also are trying to do these projects with early access binaries. Um, so Michael will give some links later where you can actually go and download binaries that have uh, you know, early access versions of some of the features we're working on now uh, and try them out and, and tell, us, tell us what you think. Um, because ultimately, you know, the things that we do, we don't do just because they're interesting academic exercises, right? You know, Java is a technology that is very much there to be used, and we want people to use it, and we can only make it good if you, if you tell us how it works for you in real life. Um, okay, so let's see. I think, uh, you know, here two, uh, very close two and a half decades on, um, you know, we view Java as a technology that is very relevant and very vibrant. Um, you know, it, it tends to be hard in our industry for technologies to persist and remain popular. Um, but, you know, we see Java as a technology that is as relevant today as it was 10 years ago, as, as it was 20 years ago. Um, and part of the reason is that we're constantly investing in continuing to solve problems um, to make your lives easier. Um, you can see just, you know, a little bit of a roadmap there. 
um, and uh, a nice little little graph from you know one place that measures these kinds of things um, on you know the popularity of, of Java. Um, so one of the areas that we think about a lot now, and I'm, I'm sure you do too, is Java's readiness for the cloud and how suitable it is as a technology there. Um, this is something that you know, we're, we're very passionate about um, and have been actively putting in features, thinking about how could we make the experience of using Java in the cloud work really, really well. Um, and there's some interesting aspects of that, right? I think uh, you know one of the things that we tend to see, I you know, uh, go and ask people, you know, well, is this important or is this important? Um, as an example, um, how many think that small footprint and fast startup time is important? I certainly do. Yeah, just about everyone. How many people think that um, massive heaps and low latency are important? Yeah, so if you're doing something like ML or uh, you know, AI, um, you, know, you want to be able to handle that as well. And so you know, it's kind of interesting, right, that we have these you know, two sorts of problems that in many ways are kind of headed in different directions. Um, and if you ask people which one are important, they go, yeah, both of those. So, okay, great, we'll try to do everything. Um, you know, we, we, we want to do all of those things well, and I hope that some of the projects that we're gonna talk about today will give you some insight into uh, some of the things that we're doing there. Okay, so Java as a technology um, is something that is as popular as it is today because many vendors take part in its development. Um, this has been true pretty much since the beginning, since uh, we started on Java at Sun, um, and it is true today. Um, we do our development in OpenJDK, uh, and a nice thing about that is you can actually see check-ins happening. You can see reviews happening. Um, you can basically go and see who's doing what. Uh, and I think you know, that's kind of a nice way to get some insight into where the investment is coming in um, towards Java as it is today and, and towards the future of Java. And so as you can see, there, there are quite a, a few folks that take part. Um, the reality is most of the investment that is happening today um, is coming from Oracle. So that's, that's good to know. Um, these are the projects that we're going to go through in a little bit here. Um, I wanted to first mention, I know uh, one of my colleagues down in the, in the um, show floor said that uh, he was getting a lot of questions from folks about the release cadence and uh, the support model. Um, so I'm happy to ask, answer questions about this you might have um, later, either at the end of the session or, or tomorrow. Um, I think the important thing to understand is that um, in the past we had a model with a very, very uh, long time between releases. Um, and so basically what would happen is we would go and kind of, you know, sit under a rock and work on stuff for a long time and then we would sort of come out uh, with something that was, you know, pretty big, often, you know, had very major changes um, and was often quite disruptive. And the result of that was that it often took a long time for people to adjust to that disruption. Um, and to you know, take their applications and move them up to the next version or start to write new things that were taking advantage of, of things in those new versions. Um, what we have done, and in fact we did as of uh, two years ago, is we have moved to a model where we release very frequently. So we have new versions that come out every six months. And of course, we're not, we, we haven't sort of waved a magic wand and all of a sudden we can do you know, two to three years of work in six months. Um, instead, what we're doing is having incremental releases that have uh, a lot less in them. Um, and we still have the same dedication that we've always had to uh, compatibility and to uh, being able to go up to new versions. But by having these smaller increments, um, it becomes easier for you with your application to move forward, right? So our goal here is really never have big disruptive releases that take multiple years. Instead, take the innovation that we're doing and get it in your hands much more quickly. And so basically the way that this, this model works um, is that the latest release is always free. So our binaries that we produce directly from OpenJDK um, are available under an open source license under GPL v2. Uh, with ClassPath, and then basically you can always just upgrade. 
Okay. Um, for people who would like the luxury of staying on an old version for you know years and years and years, um, as you know many many corporations do, um, you know we offer uh, LTS release, so long term support release. It's very similar to you know what you see in um, in the Linux community, um, where basically you will get updates that don't have uh, new features, that don't have changes to the language or APIs, uh, that just have essentially um, stability performance and security fixes. Um, and so the intent of that is that those are you know, quite easy for you to, if you have something running, you know, a, a lot of people have an application they wrote years ago, they have it running in production, they just want it to keep running, right? Um, they're perhaps not doing a bunch of active uh, development on it. Um, that, that's what this is very suitable for. And in fact, that's a model that has existed for Java um, pretty much since the beginning, right? It was exactly the same for Java 6 and Java 7. Uh, and now that is the case for Java 8 and 11. Uh, and going forward with these six month releases, there will be one of those effectively every three years, right? So that gives you a choice. You can choose to take your application and move forward as new versions come out, or you can choose to, uh, to do the long-term support um, with us or with another vendor. There are, are plenty of people out there, you know, you know, as I mentioned earlier, who are uh, you know, trying to do active support for Java. Um, one thing I'd say to keep in mind, if you're, if you're uh, considering uh, where you want to get Java updates from, is that chart I showed you before of who's doing the work, right? And so, the main thing there is you, if you're going to get updates from someone, you want to know that they're the ones who know the technology really, really well. Um, this model um, has been uh, received pretty well. Um, I, you can see a quote here from, from James Governor. Um, I think the, uh, there are a lot of people who sort of talk about this but don't talk about uh, the actual pricing. So I think, you know, uh, some people have come to me and said, well, they have an impression that Oracle is very expensive. Um, we actually base the pricing on this to try to make it simple and easy and inexpensive, um, but kind of scale with your usage. Uh, so, so we looked at other uh, kinds of software that people use in a similar way to Java to sort of understand what a reasonable model would be. Um, you can see the prices here, $25 um, per month on the server um, and $2.50 uh, for desktops. And it's, it scales down with volume. Right, so if you have you know a thousand servers, that's not the price you're going to pay, uh, and in fact the the prices for that are on the website if you're if you're interested in what the discount is. Okay, um, and then with that, of course, you know you you get uh, what all the things you would expect. You know, years of support. You get the ability to you know call us and have somebody on my team. Right, so you get the person who wrote uh, you know a particular language feature being able to be the one who's who's doing a fix for you. Okay, so with that, I'm, I want to hand off to Michael, and he's going to talk about uh, those project I mentioned earlier, where we're doing ongoing development. Thank you, George. Uh, oh, and I should also say, I'm Michael Vidstad. I run the JVM team at Oracle. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the products that we are working on. I'm not going to cover all of them. We have, I think it's like 40 different products in OpenJDK in total, not all of which are being actively developed, but I'll touch on a few of the most important ones, and it's basically the ones in the bubbles here. Uh, so the first thing I should say, by the way, is uh, as George mentioned earlier, uh, our products are being developed in the open. If you're curious to see what's going on, uh, if you want to look at the code or play around with it, you can get access to the mailing list, you can get the code. We do publish early access binaries. Uh, and I have a, a slide at the very end with some links, uh, and we do really need your help testing things out and giving us feedback on the features so that we know that what we're doing is actually relevant to you. Uh, the projects, like in the past when we had these like releases every two, ha two and a half, three years, uh, we very much had uh, feature-driven releases. So we early, early on we picked which features should go into a certain release and then uh, manager, us managers were running around being proactively stressed up about what was going to happen two and a half or three years from now, right? That can't uh, work in a, in a time-bound release model, the one we have right now, where we do a release every six months and it's like on a specific day, right? So we need to change our whole way of developing things. So much more of the development now is going on inside projects, and those are the ones that I'll, I'll go through. Uh, and what we try to do, though, is uh, identify subsets of the functionality that can stand on its own and deliver that incrementally and more quickly. We're not going to implement the whole project before we actually put it in mainline, right? Um, 
so again, a lot of these projects are being developed on the side, but like parts of it we're trying to take and actually integrate in mainline, even if the, the, the product then continues to, to live on, right? So uh, I'll, especially uh, for the Amber product, I'll show a couple of examples of that. The by far biggest and most complicated project that we have going on right now is Valhalla. So this product is looking at adding what used to be known until last week, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't say what it was used, used to be called, uh, I'll bring the new term now, it's inline types or inline classes. Uh, and so what's that? Uh, first uh, quiz here, so is this uh, um, type stateless? As in, when I've created it, can I actually go in and change it in some way? Is there, is there anything in there I can do? Somebody will mention reflection, ignore reflection. Okay, so this, the answer is that really it should, right? Everything is final, it should be read-only. There's no way you can affect this once it's created. That's only almost correct. Problem is that uh, every instance in Java can be synchronized. And you may not think of that as state that lives in the instance, but it is there. Any, any object you have, you can, you can synchronize on. And that's like the hidden state. The state that the JVM needs to keep in mind and that makes this object in some way carry state despite the fact that on the Java level it sort of doesn't, right? Uh, there are also other subtle things about state or identity in this case where a single instance we actually promise, this is like in the spec it says, if you have an instance you can compare it to another instance, the same instance. If you get this instance in two different ways, we're going to promise you that if you do double equals on it, you'll get true. Uh, and what that means concretely is that the JVM does need to keep uh, a lot of information about this instance uh, in a single unique place, if I put it that way, and that place is normally on the Java heap. Uh, I, I also had identity hash code there, not to be confused with object hash code, uh, but same concept, same identity piece. So what the JVM typically does, and obviously this can depend on your JVM implementation, but uh, what the JVM typically does is that at the top of, like the very start of every instance on the Java heap, there's a header. Uh, and we store all kinds of information in there. Obviously the type of the instance, but also things like, uh, is this object locked? And in that case, which thread actually locked it? And things like that. Now the problem that this has is that we do, as I mentioned, need to keep that single unique instance. We need to know exactly which one it is and where it is and what state it has. And that uh, reduces the amount of optimizations we can do inside of the JVM. So for example, right now if you have a, a JDK and you download it and you uh, create this user-defined point type that I had earlier, uh, and you create an array of that, uh, that point, so we now have a bunch of different points. On the Java heap, it will look like this. So you'll have a number of small instances, all the different points. Uh, they're spread out across the heap. And then you have an array which stores pointers to those individual instances. So there are many problems with this. Uh, the first one being uh, if you actually, let's say, want to iterate over all the points, you are now pointer chasing all over the heap. So you don't get the cache locality of this. Second thing is that you have all the headers, so now you're, you're using a lot more memory to store effectively the information that is only in the end the x and y coordinates. So what Valhalla, the project, is trying to achieve, uh, among other things, is this. It, I, I think most of you probably, you know, this is so obvious, right, that why aren't we already doing this? Here you have a compact representation, there's no uh, overhead with individual headers. If you iterate over that array, you have everything cached locally and the CPU will prefetch for you and all those nice things. So why is this complex? Well, it turns out that uh, this, this concept has, it requires changes on everything from the Java language level all the way down to and into the most complicated and uh, let's say complex parts of the VM. Uh, so it's a very, very big project because it spans all those levels and back to what George says, we take compatibility really, really seriously. So if we could go in and change this, like put it in the first version of the Java spec or like overnight, we just put this there and everything, like we'd remove everything else that was already there, right? Things would be easy. But the problem becomes what happens if you have old code, already compiled library code. Let's say that it's a perfectly, uh, you know, an optimal hash map that somebody's done for you. And you pass in one of these new objects, right? Or the other way around. Uh, so we need to think very carefully about that and have a story for what happens in all those cases. Because the last thing we want is for Java to evolve into something that doesn't look and feel like Java anymore. And that doesn't work, right? 
the syntax may look like this. This is subject to change, uh, as the like the underscores should make it obvious. But uh, it could be as easy as basically saying inline uh, class, and you get this. And again, like the VM and the the libraries figure out what to do for you. Our tagline for this project is codes like a class, works like a long, works like an int, meaning you get all the flexibility and the power of Java classes. You can add methods, you can do computations, you can pass them around, but you get the performance profile of a, of a simple primitive because we all know that passing an int around, that's very, very uh, efficient, right, and fast. From a like user perspective, in most ways, the only visible change here is it gets a lot faster. So. Uh, how can we motivate that, right? Just how much faster is this? Like we've spent, I think it's more than five years now easily, man, many man decades on this project already and we still haven't delivered anything. So how can we motivate this project? Um, let's look at an example. So uh, we have here matrix multiplication. So uh, it's a simple complex class. So it's a com complex number stored in the matrix. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, operations, add and multiply in this case they sort of do what you'd expect them to do, right? So they create a new instance, uh, uh, take the value, multiply it with the other thing, and return a new instance, so basically. Um, if we want to do a multiply, uh, again, this, I copied it from somewhere, so I'm sure that somebody has verified that the code actually does the right thing. The point is that um, in order to do this, you are creating a new complex, a new matrix, basically. So you're taking your existing uh, uh, matrices and you're creating a new one, right? Uh, and there's a lot of pointer chasing and there's a lot of allocation going on in, inside of this code. Um, so running this on a JDK today versus running it with uh, the new value types functionality would look something like this. And as, the, as it says there, right, your mileage may vary and all of that. but. The point is, uh, the boxed version here is the existing, let's say, uh, normal instances, and the value version of it is when you, when the VM is free to not necessarily put it on the heap, but put it in registers locally on the stack and do all the optimizations without having to care about that identity and all that stuff, right? So as you can see, the factor here, it's like 12 times less time. Uh, it, it's a thousand times less uh, memory allocated uh, it is three, well, and then it gets more CPU specific, but like fewer instructions are being uh, executed uh, and every instruction actually is faster because there's a lot less waiting for memory and things like that. So pick your favorite metric, but this is pretty significant, right? If you can speed up Java somewhere between 2.6 and 1,000 times, we're, we're doing pretty well, right? So that's why we think this uh, project is still worth investing in. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Um, lots of cool stuff happening here. Uh, we have come to the point in this pro project now that where we are actually not just looking at the existing, like the next milestone or deliverable, but also looking beyond that. How can we make sure that whatever we end up with at least has some kind of high likelihood of being future safe in case we want to build other things on top of it? Uh, so, um, for example, it gets even more interesting when you add generics to this whole story. So what happens if you want to have a generic over a, a, a primitive, let's say, like an int? Um, cool project. Uh, keep your eyes on it. Uh, the second product I'm going to say something about is Amber. Uh, Amber is effectively a product that is uh, made up of small uh, language improvements. Uh, so uh, the tagline for this is right-sizing language ceremony. Uh, right sizing here does not mean uh, stripping Java down, the syntax down to the point where it's you know cryptic. We still want it to be readable. You read the code a lot more than you write it, right? Uh, but it is trying to uh, identify the common patterns uh, and make it easier to, to implement code and easier again to read the code in the end as well. So I go through uh, a few of these uh, sub features, let's say, of this project. Uh, the first one being uh, local variable type inference. So first, the poll. How many people here are uh, uh, using Java 8? Java 9? 10? 11? 12? 13? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so how many people have played around with 10 or later? Okay, a few. How many have people have tried var specifically or the local variable type inference? Okay, a couple of you. Um, so the, this is... Um, one of those like small things that a lot of other languages already have. Um, 
if you have code that looks something like this, so, uh, you know, normal open some input stream and get a stream reader and a buffer reader and all that, you, you probably recognize this pattern. This is pretty much all over the place in Java. Uh, what you can see here is obviously that there's a lot of sort of duplication. We're saying the same type is being repeated on both sides. Uh, and that's sort of, you know, redundant, you could argue. So what we did was to implement a feature called local variable type inference, uh, which allows you to, instead of saying the type uh, on the left-hand side, you can just say var. Now, this is not making the, the Java dynamically typed. The, the only thing this does is to uh, have Java C, or whatever compiler you're using, uh, uh, figure out the type on its own. So like we could deduce, like we know that it says in input stream reader here, so why do we have to say it again? And the same thing is true for the Java C compiler. It can just look at the, the right-hand side and you know, identify that it's an input stream reader, so I'll sort of put it there. You can't later assign another type to reader here. Well, unless obviously it's like a subtype of input stream reader. Uh, you can't like suddenly have it store an integer. So in the, in the background here, this var actually does sort of expand to this, right? You can, it, it's not, it's still statically typed. Um, so this is sort of a toy example. It gets more interesting if we look at something more complex. So uh, this, you don't absolutely need to understand what this code does, but point at least in, in uh, here is that this line here, especially this line here, I'm gonna say, is so long that I couldn't even fit it on a single line. And you sort of need it there for you know, preserving the type uh, uh, information and you know, getting the type safety. But again, it's, it's one of those like, you'd rather probably not write that if you can avoid it. It doesn't actually give you much more information. So why not have the Java C compiler again or somebody else figure that out for you, right? So same thing goes here. Uh, the after version using the local variable type inference functionality is hopefully much more readable. At least I think so. Um, and again, I, you, you haven't lost, like, you haven't lost the type safety and hopefully, uh, again, this is, makes more sense. You don't have to figure out exactly the, you know, how to spell that long type name there. So that's one um, feature from Amber. Uh, another one that is in currently in preview mode. So this is something that we've introduced recently as well. We have preview functionality or preview features. They're not enabled by default. They're not yet in the Java spec but they, we have uh, taken them to the point where we are, uh, we want to move forward with them, but before we lock them down and actually put them in the spec, we want some feedback. Uh, so in order to use these, uh, we've introduced a couple of options that you, you, you sort of need to opt in. You can't um, accidentally use this functionality. Uh, so you need to say enable preview and specify a release as well, just to make it very clear that you are now using something um, that is a preview, and also at runtime you need to say, yes, enable the, the preview features. This feature is called Switch Expressions. It is in preview in 12, and we're hoping to put it in 13 as a, as a uh, supported feature. That said, we only know what actually is in 13 when 13 ships. That's, that's new state of the world, right? Uh, we're not promising anything until GA, then you know. Uh, but we're hoping to make it into 13. Um, so I'm gonna show you an example here uh, where uh, we have, there's an enum with days, and there, well, there's some days you, I hope, hope you all know. Um, so they're spelled various ways. Uh, this is a sort of toy example. Here's a method that calculates the number of characters in the name uh, of, the, uh, of the day. So it's use, doing that using a switch statement so it's, uh, it's doing sort of the obvious thing. If uh, the day is Monday, Friday, or Sunday, they all have six letters, so that's awesome. Let's put that in a variable. Uh, and same for the other weekdays. Throw an exception if we find an unexpected day, and then finally return the local variable. Okay, so there are a couple of, uh, of problems with this. First, it's a bit on the long side, you could argue, but also, uh, how do you know like it, it, the pattern here is obviously that you are, for every case, you want to set a local variable, define a local variable. Uh, and surely there must be a better way of doing this because now there's a risk that in one of these cases you actually forget to set it or you, know, you forget the break or whatever it is. So what switch expressions do for you is to allow you to treat switch, uh, switch statements uh, as if they actually return a value as well. So in this case, uh, it's more compact. There's a new syntax being discussed still, I should say, uh, where you can say for like these three cases here, uh, there's an arrow syntax and uh, it returns six. 
And very specifically what happens then is that the switch, as I mentioned, actually returns a value. So like here on the, on the left hand side and today, you can't assign the sort of return value from the switch, right? It's a statement, it doesn't return a value. But in the new world, you can actually do that. So it does return a value. Um, that's preview in 12, as I mentioned. Uh, and then for completeness, I'll mention a couple more, uh, which are more for future. Uh, so there's something called pattern matching. This is an example of that. It can also, the, the vision here is that we can do the same thing in switch, uh, switches going forward as well. How many of you have done this? Uh, you are checking some instance you got and you're checking it against the type and the very next thing you need to do is to cast it, right? Super annoying, just repeating the obvious thing, right? So basically what, uh, the first thing you can do obviously is just not repeat the type twice using the local variable type inference. But the next thing here on the pattern matching side is something along these lines. So uh, you have your instance and instead of doing that like instance of plus a cast, you just do sort of the compiler does that trick for you. So you get the, the variable defined and you can use it in your if statement. That's for future, not, uh, uh, well, we're looking at it, but uh, definitely not gonna make uh, 13, I'm gonna say. The final thing I'll mention is records. Uh, so another common example I'm gonna say, so simple sort of object uh, data carrier, you have a couple of fields. And in order to make this complete, you need to have the constructor, the getters, the hash code equals compare if you want to store in a, in a collection of some kind. And obviously this is all just sort of manual work to add that and error prone and, and all of that, right? So what we're looking at here is providing something that, again, spelling, it may not be spelled record in the end, but uh, something that looks like this. And uh, if, you, if you want the defaults, then it, it doesn't take more than this. Uh, but if you do want to override things, if for example, you, your equals has some kind of magic property, then, then you can add that. Yes? Could you inline your record? What's that? Could you inline your record? Can you inline your record. Uh, so I think the answer is yes. Yes. But it hasn't been designed yet, so. <laughs> um, so that's Amber. Um, oh, and I should also mention, by the way, that the, the JEP thing uh, here is short for JDK Enhancement Proposal, and it's our way of documenting feature, uh, features uh, on a high level, I'm gonna say. Uh, provide some alternatives and you know details, but uh, just a document. You can go in and look at these. They're all on the OpenJDK site as well. Um, Loom uh, is a project we're looking, where we're looking at improving on or simplifying concurrency. So today, basically, I'm somewhat simplified, you have two different ways of handling concurrency. The first one is using synchronous um, code. So you have a thread, it takes a request, and it does its thing, it may call out to a database or do whatever. If it gets blocked, it's still waiting there patiently for the database to return the, the result, and then at some point it returns the, the result of the transaction as a whole. Super simple. It's actually sort of scalable, right? Uh, it, we worked a lot in Java to make sure that even that simple use case is working really well. But uh, there are challenges with it. So if you want to scale up to the extreme, then those threads, even though they're relatively lightweight, they do tend to add up, right? So if you have a thousand requests going on at the same time, a thousand threads, then that's, if nothing else, going to take a lot of memory for the thread stack itself. The alternative uh, that you can use is a synchronous IO and a synchronous construct. Uh, so in the JDK, for example, we offer separate methods that do implement asynchronous uh, versions of IO. Uh, and they're there, they're extremely scalable, but they are sort of complex to use. Uh, so you need to, to get it right, let's say. You now have a thread that is like multiplexing over different connections or what, whatever it is, right? Uh, and it's also sort of hard to debug and profile this in the end. So what we're trying to do with Loom here is to make this, um, the asynchronous case work for you as a developer as if it was asynchronous uh, if, if, if it was synchronous code from the start. Basically, the, the tagline is some, somewhere between making blocks, <laughs> blocking calls virtually free, or for that sake, it codes like sync, but works like async, right, in, in performance. Or concurrency made simple. So the way we're implementing this, uh, looking at implementing it, is pro by providing uh, something we call fibers. You can think of them as extremely lightweight threads. Uh, you are like, you can create millions of these in the same JVM or even billions of them. They're, they're very, very, very lightweight. 
Uh, and the other um, uh, uh, component here is it says delimited continuations here, um, mouthful. But uh, think of like execution. You call a method. Let's say you have a small method and it's in, stuck in a while loop. It's doing something. It's computing something. Uh, what we do with the continuations here uh, is that we allow that method to yield. So in the middle of its execution somewhere, we can f uh, f freeze thaw that, or sorry, freeze that, uh, and store it off somewhere on the side. So like where where it's running on a thread, but we can freeze that execution, copy only those frames that matter to the side, and then have that thread continue executing something else. Uh, and what that means for you is that you can implement these methods as if they're blocking, right? But instead of blocking, they actually yield in the background. And we, again, we take that small, the small amount of state that is running on this big dinosaur thread, and we copy that off and let the thread do something else. So we open up for basically coding as if everything is synchronous. Now, the other nice part about this is that instead of having to supply two different versions, so again, I said on the JDK side, we have synchronous IO, and we also have asynchronous IO. So we need to deliver both of those. And if you're implementing a library or framework, chances are that you will in turn have to provide both the synchronous version of your calls and the asynchronous version. And that obviously is a hassle, right? So what this allows you to do is basically just uh, provide one version, which looks like it's synchronous, and in the background, uh, the JVM and the rest of the runtime takes care of it for you. There is a prototype of this. Um, do play around with it. Uh, we are investigating alternative ways of implementing this functionality as well. So that's sort of what the status of that project is right now. Panama uh, is a project where we're looking into ep sort of things that aren't native to Java. So Panama is a pun on either like connecting the oceans, one ocean being Java and the other one being C, C++ native, or the, uh, the continents, I guess. Uh, insight here is that there are a bunch of libraries that are not implemented in Java, or that for some reason uh, where we want to reach out and actually access native data that, that is not on the Java heap in a more efficient way. So Panama is exploring exactly that. It's a safe, fast, and simple way to access, to call out to native functions against think C, C++, and also access data that isn't on the Java heap. Um, and this without having to write a single line of native code, because you can do this today. There is the JNI interface. How many people here have uh, written JNI or done JNI? We're so sorry for you. Uh, JNI is extremely hard to get right. So basically, for those of you who have not done this exercise, if you have a favorite library that you want to call, basically this is the workflow. The first thing you need to do is to study that library and understand exactly how it works. Because the next thing you need to do is to model that whole library on the Java level. Once you've done that, uh, you, are implement, you need to implement some, like not just the, 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 the raw stubs of the methods, but like actually the code to call out to native. And you, you add a bunch of me methods that are decorated with the native keyword. And then in the next step, you use a tool, Java C in this case, or Java Age used to be the name of it, to generate header files, C, C++ header files, and then you need to actually implement the JNI code that bridges between the JNI headers and Java to your favorite library. And then you need to build that shared library, finding the tool chains, and that's going to be different depending on which platform you are on. And then finally, you can actually start using the code, right? And God forbid somebody goes in and actually changes that library you're trying to mo model because now you need to go in and change everything, right? That's a bit unfortunate. Um, so what we're trying to do is to basically cut cut away like the first things here, all the ones that are error prone, because every single step here you can get wrong. And JNI, especially the bridging layer, is extremely easy to get wrong. You forget to free up a resource or something like that. So basically, this is the new model we're envisioning. You're using a tool to generate things, and the things here are actually Java classes or interfaces more specifically. So basically, this is all automated. You point it at, the, at a, a library or a header file, and it generates Java code for you. And then you can just start calling those Java methods. So you have not like written a single line of native code, and you, you can now use that library. Obviously, you still have to understand the library you're about to use, but at least there's less in the way, let's say, of doing that, right? Metropolis uh, is uh, a, also a, one of those big projects. Um, it is exploring how we can use Java more to implement the Java runtime itself. So a large part of Java, and especially the core libraries, are obviously implemented in Java, but the JVM is still native code. Uh, and 
the first thing we're looking into here is how we can move the Java, uh, the JIT compiler that lives inside of the JVM. So the compiler that takes bytecode, Java bytecode, and turns it into efficient machine code, if you so will. So that's the first thing that we're looking into. So today we have two different JIT compilers in the JVM. There's C1, also known as the client compiler, and C2, which is the server, the fully optimizing compiler that we have. So C2 is sort of reaching its complexity budget. Uh, we've, we've put a lot of good stuff into C2, but it's sort of time to, to look at if, like, what, what does the future look like the next 10, 15 years or 20. Uh, and it also turns out that a lot of these products have a big, significant impact on the compiler. We do need a lot of work in the compiler. The compiler is sort of the, the secret weapon that we have in the VM, and that needs to work really, really well for all kinds of code shapes. So for a lot of the products, we do need work in the JIT. So making it easier to Im improve on our JIT going forward is important. So what do you do when you have two of something and you want to get down to one? You add a third. In this case, we're adding something called Graal. Uh, Graal is a JIT compiler implemented in Java. Uh, and we like to think that Java, again, is, is a, uh, a good language to, to implement things in in general, so why not the compiler? Uh, pros include things like it's, again, faster to do development going forward. It's also easy. It's a lower end, uh, barrier to entry. If you want to experiment with things, you don't have to build, rebuild the JVM. You can actually work on the Java level and get all the ID, ID support and code browsing and all of that. Uh, there are a few products that are small in nature, and I'll only touch on them really quickly. Uh, one is called Scara. This product is looking at modernizing the developer experience for us that work on the JDK itself. So that, that code development is currently happening on, I'm going to call it aging, uh, and not necessarily aged with dignity, um, uh, code infrastructures. This is specifically around code reviews and uh, uh, SEM, like, yeah, taking care of the code itself. So what we're investing here, if, it, if we should move over from, uh, we're currently using Mercurial, if we should move, move over maybe to Git, it does seem like uh, there are many more tools that support Git than there are Mercur for Mercurial, uh, and also leveraging existing hosting providers like GitLab or GitHub, things like that. Lots of exciting stuff happening here. Uh, Portola, uh, George mentioned on uh, his slide earlier as well, is where we're looking at making sure that Java works really, really well in containers. How many people in here, here have heard about Alpine Linux? Oh, surprisingly many. How uh, many people in here uh, would like to see a port of the JDK to Alpine Linux? Okay, a few hands. How many people would like to help maintain and support it? <laughs> Uh, do let us know. We're trying to gauge the interest and figure out if it's worth moving forward with this. There is a project where like, the JDK actually it builds and runs stuff, but we haven't done all the testing we normally do to certify that it actually is functionally correct. Um, CGC uh, is a product where we're looking at a garbage collector that, is, uh, that has get, like, soft but still pretty good, let's say, guarantees around pause times. Um, so the goal of this project is to support very, very large heaps. So I think we just upped, I can't remember right now, we upped it to 16 terabytes or, or maybe more. Uh, but in either case, large heaps with, like, while still keeping the pause times really, really low. So uh, the goal is 10 milliseconds and we're actually below that right now. Uh, but at the same time, one of the other things that we take pride in here is you not having to tune things. It should just work out of the box without that requirement. Uh, and, uh, and we're trying to do this while keeping the throughput overhead low. So the, the goal is 15%, seems like a nice round number where most people can accept the trade-off and, and we're doing really well there as well. Uh, and then finally, I'll just mention uh, a product called JFR or J uh, JDK Flight Recorder. Uh, so imagine uh, that you're working in a project and you're actually on call in some way. So typically, you know, you can bet that it's like Sunday or Saturday evening or something, like something happens. Uh, SLA is breached somewhere. Uh, and the problem is you have no idea what's going on, right? So the first thing you do, you, you, or first thing, but like at some point you add some logging and you know, try to get more information. Logging unfortunately comes with performance overhead. So after a while, nothing's been found. You need to remove the logging because you don't want to pay for the additional servers. And you remove the logging, and obviously next Saturday at 7 p.m., again, same thing happens, right? JFR uh, is trying to solve exactly that problem by uh, piggybacking on a lot of what the JVM already does. So it's 
collecting a lot of fine-grained information about the system itself, both inside the VM, but there's also an API you can use to uh, put user-defined events into that same stream. Uh, and it's doing this in, like, the, the uh, how should I put this? It, uh, it, we're trying to make sure it's designed to be on in production. That's, that's the first thing to keep in mind. You can use this during development, obviously, but it's designed to be on in production. Uh, and it's helping you collect almost like too much information. Uh, it's, it's the default settings will collect you know, enough information for most cases, but, but uh, uh, it, it's, I, I don't know how to put this in any other way that it's extremely powerful. Uh, so you know, have a look uh, and tell us what you want, want to see going forward. So uh, last slide, I promised to give you some links to early access uh, binaries. So again, we are counting on your feedback uh, and we need your help to make sure that what we develop, the future projects, that they actually make sense, that you, know, you feel natural to work with and all that. Uh, and also to, to make sure, help ensure that the projects, the, the releases we do actually you know, work, right? That there are no issues. So for JDK 13, which is GA September something, something. Uh, it's actually a pretty good place to be right now because like these six month releases is like where we've found that uh, what we need to do is to make sure that the quality remains high on every single push we do. And what that basically does is that when a release comes along, it's like a non-event. It's like we draw a line and say, Here, what, here's what, what went into this release. And then the next three months, we just more or less sit around our old thumbs and it's like, and then suddenly GA comes along, right? And it's like, yeah, well, fair enough. We almost forgot about the JDK 12 release just a few weeks ago. So in September, we're releasing 13. We are publishing on a weekly basis, uh, early access binaries for 13. So please pick up, try them out, and let us know if, uh, if you find any issues, or for that sake, even if you like what's in there, right? And the positive feedback is also nice to get some, from time to time. Uh, and then uh, for the projects, uh, these are a few of the projects that we're also publishing early access binaries for. So again, if you're curious to try out Valhalla uh, or Panama, or we have a J package uh, product as well now, that's where you can find them. That was it. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so hopefully uh, this was useful, uh, getting you know both a, a little bit of an overview of sort of the status and where things are with Java, how we go about developing it, um, and, uh, and, and finally a deep dive into a bunch of the projects that we're working on, um, trying to keep making it better for you. Um, so I think we have time for maybe a couple of questions.